Good morning. <laughs> Almost nobody's awake. <laughs> I know you're awake because you just saw that last act, which was fantastic. Anyhow, um, welcome to Autodesk University, Germany. It's a pleasure to be here this morning. What I want to do this morning, so I just wanted to talk about the future of the way things are designed and engineered and the way that things are made. And so I just want to take kind of a wide-ranging view of where we are today and where things are going. And in particular, I wanted to look at four things. First one I wanted to look at is how do we capture what it is that we want to make? How do, how do, we, how do we get it into the computer? The second thing is, how do we compute upon it? The third one is, how do we work together or how do we collaborate? And the last part is, how do we create it or make it or fabricate it? So let's just start with the idea of capture. And why do we want to capture stuff? Because here's the reason. In the end, the thing that we want is we want to get a computable model. We want something that the computer can operate on because we want to understand the thing we're going to make, the thing we're going to build. We want to understand how it's going to look. We want to understand how it's going to function. We want to understand how it's going to perform. And so what we need is a model, a model that can exist in the computer that we can operate on. Now, many of you have been capturing data from the world for years. You've also been inputting data in order to create your own models. So what's really changed? The first thing that's changed is that the act of capturing, whether through photography or laser scanning or LIDAR scanning, has become cheap. It's affordable. We can do it frequently. Here, here's an example of actually capturing a mechanical part, a shock absorber. What's interesting about this is when we capture it, we often turn it into a point cloud, a series of points in space. For some things, computing on things in space is good enough. But here's an interesting thing. Here we've been able to take those points, in, this is inside Fusion 360, and we were able to take that series of points that exist in space and turn it into an analytical surface that we can use to model upon and do whatever we want. So interesting thing of, it's not only the representation in the computer, but it's this ability to move back and forth between different representations that's increasingly becoming important. Here's an example on a completely different scale. This is an example of the Denver International Airport, in which they frequently, during the construction of the project, were able to scan the project. And this is an example where many times just the point cloud is good enough. We can understand lots of what's going on on the site by just looking at the point cloud. We can understand if there's interference. We can understand where to move equipment. We can understand where to stage the new materials. Here's another example. By the way, this is not a photograph that's a point cloud. Um, I, at times it's indistinguishable from a photograph. But that's our point cloud, and we now have customers who every day or every week are going around, usually using robots, um, small autonomous vehicles with cameras on them to actually capture what's in a factory. So we've gone from being able to do this once a project to people are now doing this every day. Now, like I said, the real point of capturing information was to be able to compute. It's to be able to use it to understand the things we're going to build. And for anyone who's ever been involved in a project, if you've ever made anything, if you've ever designed and engineered things, what you know is that if at the beginning of the project you knew what you know at the end, you might do things differently. And so the idea is we're trying to use the computer to build a digital prototype of the thing we're going to build so we understand it as much as possible. Now, when we think of computing, the question I have for you is what would you do differently? How would you design differently if you had all the computing power in the world? How would you engineer things differently 
if computing was free. And right now, computing is not quite free, but it's close. You know, nowadays I can go rent a CPU for about four cents an hour, maybe five cents an hour. So if you think about that, I can have four CPUs working all day long for the price of an espresso. It's amazing how cheap it is. And the interesting thing about computing is it's the only asset that we have, it's the only resource that we have that is getting cheaper over time and it's getting cheaper in a predictable way. We know next year that that computing will be cheaper, that cost of the CPU hour will be less, and we also know probably that the cost of that espresso will be more. So the question is, what is it about this idea? And it's an idea that I like to call infinite computing. The idea that with the power of the cloud, we have all the computing resources available. We have an infinitely scalable amount of computing resources. Now, I think one of the problems we have is that up until now, we have all thought of computing as a scarce and precious resource something to be saved, something to be cherished, not to be used. But if you change your mind, if you change your mindset, and you change your tool set, you can do things differently. So I wanna take a look at how we might do things differently if we had all the computing power in the world. The first thing is, we would like to understand the things we design and build. We'd, under, we'd like to understand what they look like. In this case, we'd like to understand the aerodynamics. And we'd like to understand the aerodynamics of it before we commit any capital to actually manufacture this automobile. Now, one of the traditional problems in engineering is that we're often making trade-offs. We're often trading off, you know, things like strength and weight and cost. And as one goes up, the other goes down. And we try to balance those variables. And we try to find an optimum mix of those different components. So here's, a, here's an example. This is from our product mold flow. And it's about taking uh, the mold temperature, the melt temperature, and the flow rate. So three factors that greatly affect the outcome for plastic injection molded parts. And one of the things we can now do, if you go back to what I was saying about computing being free, the usual way we might test this is you might pick a triple of numbers. You might say, I want the mold temperature here and I want the melt temperature here. And we, ta we take those variables and we would try that and we would simulate it. Now, a simulation in this case might take about 24 hours. It might take 48 hours to do this simulation. But why don't we ask ourselves the question of instead of asking this one at a time and doing it in a serial fashion, what if instead we looked at the entire space and we explored the space and did it in parallel? And we looked through the space and we try to find the optimum answer. And using com computerized techniques and statistical methods, we can find near optimal answers to the question. So rather than doing it one at a time, and coming back and getting the answer and then trying again and doing it again until you run out of time or money or patience, why don't you just do them all at once? And so we're creating tools that allow you to run simulations on entire sets of data at the same time. Here's another example of where we can start really using computers to help us design things. You know, it's kind of funny, I've been in this business for a long time, we often call it the CAD business, computer-aided design. But for most of us, the computer has never aided us at all. All the computer has actually done is recorded what we thought it should do. It's pretty dumb when it comes right down to it. The computer just sits there and waits for you to tell it something. What if instead, the things we could start telling it were at a higher level, and the computer actually started to aid us in the design of the things we make? And so there's this interesting new area 
of generative design. And I think it's a really interesting new area in which we're going to start being able to specify some of the properties and characteristics that we want from our designs, and the computer is going to act on our behalf to fulfill those needs. Here's an example of doing it with buildings, where each of these buildings uh, was generated by the computer in response to the request of the architect. Let me show you another example here. I think this is a really interesting example. This is a bracket from a, a Formula One car. Often trying to make this as strong as possible and as light as possible, designed to fit the conditions of that day. So here's a traditional one. Now let me show you some work we did on, on, on this bracket. Instead, what we said to the computer is, what I need is a hole in the middle, I have some mounting points, it needs to fill this space envelope. Using a variety of optimization techniques, each the one in the middle and the one on the right were generated automatically by the computer. So this was a case of optimizing the topology of the thing we were building in which no person went in and drew all those individual struts. It was something that was done by the computer. So it's an interesting thing to consider when we will start directing the computer with higher levels of abstraction, where we have commands and we talk about what we want to have happen. We talk about the outcomes we desire instead of the means by which we get there. So let me show you another example. This is a heat exchanger. Heat exchanger, you know, intended to maximize the exchange of heat between two fluids. You need to make sure that the fluid flows smoothly between them in order to maximize that. This, like, like the Formula One before it, was 3D printed in metal. But the interesting thing about it is no human designed this in the traditional sense. Instead, we specified the requirements of what we wanted it to do. We talked about how we wanted it to perform, and we spent tens of thousands of CPU hours to calculate this. So at first it sounds crazy, but remember what I said about infinite computing and nearly being free. And at four cents an hour, it's not that bad to have an optimal heat exchanger designed at four cents an hour if it takes 10,000 hours. Here's just a close-up. One of the things that I think is amazing about this is not only how well it performs, but how good it looks. And it's easy to imagine the computer making ugly things. It's a, li it's a little bit more challenging for, for all of us, me included, to think that it actually can design beautiful things. Here's an example of the same thing, where we did it with buildings, where again we said, I want to specify some of the outcomes I want to do space planning, but I want to let the computer for the first time actually do CAD. I want computer-aided design. I want it to help me go through. In the end, I'm still going to select. I'm going to make the choices. I'm going to curate the decisions, but the computer is actually going to suggest things that I might not have imagined. Here's some work we're doing with Airbus. So we did some work with Airbus over the last few years trying to imagine the future of air travel. And so this is an airplane. It's a concept. It has not flown. Um, I'm not sure it'll fly in the next few years, but this was a concept uh, that we uh, worked on with Airbus, imagining what air travel would look like in the future. And again, it comes about because we can design things differently and we can fabricate them differently. In this case, what's really interesting is, you know, when we all sit in an airplane and it shakes and you hit turbulence, you know, and everybody sits there and worries how far the wings are going to fold and whether it's going to break, you can actually see in some ways the structure of the airplane from this and understand where it really needs to be strong and where it really doesn't matter hardly at all. Here's, a, here's another image of what it might look like to fly from the ins inside of the cabin instead of the outside. Now let me talk about the next area. 
The third thing I wanted to talk about was how we collaborate. I don't think any of us work on projects by ourselves. It's rare indeed to have any project of any size that's done by one person. It's, it's rare to even be one company. There's also been multiple groups, multiple teams, multiple companies. And I would, say, I would submit to you today that the way we go about working with each other is pretty old fashioned. You know, so if you're using email and Dropbox and you know, all those other tools to move your information around, it's probably not the best way to do it. We all do it, we're all guilty of it, but it's still probably not the best way to get work done. So what I want to do is talk about the way we're envisioning that people will work in the future when they do design and engineering. And so I'll use the example of our new product. Our new product is called Fusion 360. It's a mechanical and industrial design product. What's interesting about it, it's a cloud-based product. And the, the thing for me that's interesting about a cloud-based product is that it enables two things. Because the question is, why do we want to make cloud-based software? And there's really two reasons in my mind. The first is to tap into that infinitely scalable computing. We want access to all those computing resources to help us use the full power of what computing is capable of. The second one is, when you have cloud-based projects, it's a natural hub, it's a natural center for where we can collaborate. It's always ironic to me that people talk about whether it's Industry 4.0 or integrated industry, integrated manufacturing, the future of manufacturing. They talk about different kinds of project types for architecture and construction. And people try to take an architecture of behind the firewall and map it to an environment in which they're working with multiple companies. It's always struck me as far more natural that you would have a central hub in the cloud to coordinate amongst the companies that are dispersed. So the two reasons for me to be interested in the cloud are number one, to tap into infinite computing, and the second reason is to have a central point to coordinate. So here's an example of the Fusion 360 product. Number one, it runs on multiple platforms. It runs on Macs and PCs and on web browsers. Um, what, what's important about it is I think it shows the future of where we're going and how we're going to make software applications. So what it does, it works on form and function and fabrication. It's all about how something looks, how it performs, and how we, how we make it. Here's an example of, of a little bit of a close-up of one of the parts. And here's where we get to the collaboration. You know, some people take a look at this and they say, oh, it looks a little bit like Facebook. Well, it's not intended to look like Facebook, but I think there's an interesting parallel there. Why should we know more about our nephew's soccer game than we know about the projects at work? I think it's increasingly important that we have tools that are built into our designs that enable us to know who's doing what, we want to be up to date, we want to understand everything that's going on on that project. And we should be as up to date on our projects at work as we are in our social activity in our personal lives. The other thing that's important because I think the future of computing the technology platform for it is changing. I've watched a number of transitions. I've watched the world go from mainframes to workstations, workstations to PCs, and every time I was told that the new platform would not succeed. There are always people there who said, it will not do it. I remember when PCs were first coming out, and I was, visi I was visiting a German car maker who insisted that they need to manufacture their own workstations because you could never design a car on a PC. I tell you today, every single car, every one of us drives is designed on a PC. So we've always sat there. It's easy to find examples of what we can't do, but I think we often underestimate how fast technology will progress 
And in the same way, I submit to you that the future of computing is going to be about computing on the cloud and connected devices. It's about getting access to the information wherever we are, where, whenever we want it. This is one other example I just want to show in this way. What's interesting about this, it's not only a beautiful image um, of the part. What I really like about it, this was generated automatically. So while, once we finished working on it, all of the views were rendered automatically. And what I think is interesting about this, this is the computer. Remember, it's going back to this idea. The computer is actually doing something on our behalf. It's actually helping us. And it assumes that computing is relatively cheap. As opposed to waiting for me to go tell it, why don't we just preemptively go off and compute something that might be useful? Now, that seems incredibly wasteful if computing is expensive. If computing is cheap, let's run off and do it. All you guys know who this is? <laughs> OK. So I'm not here to argue whether Edward Snowden is a hero or a traitor. Although I am willing to do it later today. You know, if you buy me a beer, I'm happy to have a conversation about Edward Snowden. So anyone who wants to have the discussion later. I think there's a lot to be learned about Edward Snowden, but I wanted to, there was one thing in particular I wanted to focus in on relative to this conversation about using the cloud for computing. And here's the idea. Here's what I would submit to you, that the most interesting thing about Edward Snowden in the con context of cloud computing, and this may be the first time anyone's ever tried to tie Edward Snowden to cloud computing, but let me try. Here's the most interesting thing about Edward Snowden. It demonstrates to me something that I've always believed, that the biggest vulnerability in security is always us. We are the most vulnerable part of any operation of any organization. Say what you will about the CIA and NSA. The one thing I can say for certain and that we could all agree on is they spend a huge amount of money trying to protect their data. And yet, one single person was able to uncover all kinds of secrets and tell it to the rest of the world. Now, I was traveling around Germany yesterday. I met with a bunch of customers. And in particular, there was one gentleman who was telling me he thinks the cloud is an interesting idea, but, you know, maybe not in Germany. <laughs> and I was on my best behavior. <laughs> yes, maybe not in Germany, but I, uh, I would say a few years from now, I'd be surprised. As a matter of fact, I was looking at a survey of CIOs in Germany. And on one hand, they say, the cloud, we're not ready for it, it's not us. And then on the other hand, when you look at areas of investment, 50% of the investment is going into cloud computing. So I don't quite understand the difference, but it goes back to this idea. The biggest reason I think many people are rightfully uh, cautious about the cloud is the idea of protecting intellectual property and protecting secrets. But I would tell you that this idea that security comes from this model of building a castle and a moat. That some way we can separate ourselves from all the people who want access to their secrets by building this thing around it. If nothing else, Edward Snowden demonstrated to us that that is patently false. By far the greatest vulnerability we have is not whether we use 256-bit encryption or how we communicate things. The biggest, the biggest vulnerability is all of us. Okay, enough for cloud computing. I'm looking forward to the beer for anyone who wants to discuss Edward Snowden later. Okay, so one of the things we did is we built a product a year or so ago called PLM360. And what was interesting to us, once again, was we built it as a cloud-based platform because we thought the cloud, the architecture of the cloud, mirrored the architecture of the people who needed to participate. PLM is mostly for supply chain, for companies working with their customers, and we thought the architecture of that economic structure was mirrored by the architecture of the cloud. So here we, here we built a product 
We never built a PLM product that went behind a firewall. We didn't think that's the place where it was gonna be deployed. We didn't think that's where it would actually meet the needs. I think there's dozens of multi-million dollar projects that never really succeeded that are a testament to the fact that PLM is better in the cloud than it is behind the firewall. So here, here's, the sa here's the same thing when that project moved on, all of a sudden when you wanna manage the process of introducing this to the market or quality control or change control, now you have a cloud-based product to do this. And once again, the important thing is we can access this information from anywhere on any device, just like we do for all the things in our personal life. Looks very blank. Look, does it look blank up there? <laughs> okay, let me, let, me let me talk about a new product that we have that's just coming out. It's just being released. It's about an easy to use, widely available platform for sharing. It's called A360. A360 is our platform for, for everybody working on projects together to share the information, have up-to-date information, to be able to view and mark up files, to be able to search and find things on a project, to communicate with everyone else and to notify people of the changes on a project. It's only been out for two months. We have 40,000 people already using A360. So here's what it looks like. Looks a little bit like that part that I showed you in Fusion. And the reason it looks a lot like that part in Fusion, A360 is built into Fusion. A360 will be built into all of our applications so that everybody working with any Autodesk application has a way to share this information with all the other people involved on the project. One of the things that we think is most important is who is on the project, how you work with them. I had an interesting experience about three or four years ago. It was one of the things we did at Autodesk. It was the summertime. Summertime's a little bit quiet. And so we said, we said to the people on the team, why don't we go out and we'll form four teams. And why don't you go out and think about what the future of design and engineering looks like. So we sent out four teams. They went out for a month. And they came back and they presented to us their, version, their vision of what the future looks like in terms of how design will be done. And truthfully, those of us who are listening, most of us being self-professed geeks and nerds, thought we would hear about how the software was gonna get better, how the computers were gonna get faster, how we were gonna have more bandwidth, you know, what the devices were gonna look like. That's not what we heard at all. Four different teams that went off and thought about this came back and talked about how their projects are gonna be structured in the future, who they're gonna work with, how they wanna find the best people in the world, who they're gonna collaborate with, how they're gonna share information. It was all about the people they were gonna work with and how they could interact with them, and that's what they imagined the future of work, was all about the people. It was less about the thing. And we took that lesson to heart and we've built it into all of the products so that people can really share and coordinate and collaborate. Because I think in many ways, the thing that gets in the way of using the tools of today is exactly that. It's how do we move the information around? How do we tell each other about changes? How do we access that information anytime and anywhere we want to? Now let me move on to the fourth thing. Because almost all of you after you're done making something on the screen, behind that glass, it eventually becomes a real world object. We're all interested in making real physical artifacts. We wanna bring it from the digital back to the analog. We talked in the beginning about capture, which was taking that analog and turning it to digital. But in the end, we do wanna take that digital and turn it back to analog. So there are four kinds of manufacturing, four ways of making things that I often think about. One is additive manufacturing, one is subtractive manufacturing, the third is robotic assembly, and then the fourth is biological. So let's look at this. Additive manufacturing has gotten a lot of press. It's very popular, everyone wants to talk about it. 
When I think about additive manufacturing, what I'm really interested in is not the toys. I'm not interested in toy soldiers or um, little Pez dispensers with your kid's head on it. Those are kind of cute, but that's not what the future of 3D printing is about. The future of 3D printing is about industrial uses. It's about how we're going to use it to make things that we make products and buildings and everything else out of. So where is it, where's it going to come from? And in some ways, I would say, when we look at 3D printing, we're probably about equivalent to, you know, like the 1980s when it comes to PCs. We're in the very early part of it. You know, when we went from the very early days with the PC not being useful to, uh, I suspect, every single person in this room has a supercomputer in their pocket. Supercomputer, certainly in 1980 terms, and you probably paid no more than three or $400 for that supercomputer in your pocket. I'd say the same thing about 3D printing. We're in the early part of this. It will develop. It probably won't take 30 years to get to the same level of sophistication. But there are a number of things that need to change. The first one is materials. What I particularly like about this printer, this is a printer that starts to solve one of the problems. It prints long strand carbon fiber along with the plastic. So you will have printed composite parts. This is a printer in the sub $10,000 range that's just coming to market. There are others who are doing carbon composite printers as well. So you'll get away from you know, one of the limitations today of 3D printing is you often get cheap plastic that's not really good for anything but rapid prototypes. We'll start seeing this with new materials. Here's another interesting thing. This is done by an artist in Amsterdam named Joris Larman. This is 3D printing of metal. Think about what it really is. It looks a lot like welding. It looks like MIG welding, as a matter of fact. But what is 3D printing a metal? It's exactly that. And I love the fact that this work is being done by an artist. And I think it reminds me all the time that we need to be open to find the ideas, the interesting new ideas, wherever they come from. And we can't always just assume you go one place and find the answer. This is some really interesting work, some of the most progressive work I've seen on metal 3D printing but it's being done by a very small team of people led by Joris in Amsterdam. Here's a 3D printed building. It's in our future. We will have 3D, we will have 3D printed buildings. Um, when you think about it, all the same things that apply to plastic objects of this size can be done with concrete objects of that size. Let me talk a little bit about what we're doing. Um, many of you may have heard of Spark. How many have heard, let me ask, how many have heard of Spark? Handful, handful, maybe quarter. So one of the things that we decided to do this year in order to help solve some of the problems and kind of kickstart the industry and try to make that 30 year journey of getting from where we are today with 3D printing to where it's going, uh, we announced that we were making a software platform for 3D printing. One, a software platform that would work with any printer, would work with 3D models created in any software, and would allow you to output it to any device. That software platform is called Spark. Um, it's an open soft, software platform that we will freely distribute to other manufacturers of computers and 3D printers. But one of the things that was important is we wanted to demonstrate with 3D printing what the experience should look like when you had integrated hardware and software. Because truthfully today, using 3D printers is too hard. So here's, a, this is actually our 3D printer. Um, it will be coming out later this year. Um, it's made with a DLP, it uses fo um, photo resins. And we are bringing it out as a printer that works on top of the Spark platform. Here's a, here's a, here's a close-up. I actually had to ask somebody, is this a rendering or a photograph? It's getting harder and harder to tell these days. And the interesting thing to me about what we're doing here is we're doing something which I hope is important for moving the industry forward. We've decided to make the software platform open. 
We've decided to make, we will publish the plans for the printer. So we will have open hardware. Anybody who wants to take these plans is free to make the same machine or a different machine. And then the third thing, which I think is important, because I think the business models of 3D printing today stifle innovation. Um, and we are gonna make the specification for the materials open as well. You can buy materials from us, you can buy it from others, but we're encouraging people to experiment. And so what we really wanted was a platform for experimentation so that 3D printing moves forward. And when you go back and you think of all those really interesting shapes I showed you, where we had the heat exchanger or the bracket for the Formula One car, all those kinds of things are gonna, are gonna require new ways of making them. Let me just say one more thing while we're on this subject. Um, I'm really glad that Autodesk did this year, this year. The other thing I'm really glad about is we decided after many years to change our policy about how we deal with the students of the future. And I talked to so many of our customers who talk about the need to hire, train people into the workforce, to encourage young people to be interested in science and technology and engineering and math. So one of the things we did this year is we decided to make all of our software, all of our professional software, available for free. It's available for free for students, for faculty and institutions. And so if I do nothing else this morning, the one thing I ask you to do is whether you do this as a parent, whether you do this as a potential employer, um, please let people know that all of the Autodesk software is available for free for schools and students and faculty. All you need to do in order to download it is to go to students.autodesk.com. Thanks, I'm, I'm really proud of doing that. Okay, let me show you this other thing. This is some awesome work as we move into robotics. This is work that's done, done by Akim Menges at the University of Stuttgart. This is using multiple industrial robots to construct an architectural structure. Probably many of you here have seen this. When I showed in the US, many fewer people are familiar with his work. I think the work they're doing down there at the Institute is phenomenal. And so what they're doing is a combination of wrapping glass fiber and carbon fiber automatically in a wet layup to create architectural structures that look like this. Here's another interesting example. This is the idea of as we move forward, we're gonna see a combination of these techniques. So I talked about these different ways, but to me this is interesting. So this is a combination machine, it's made by DMG Mori, um, in which you 3D print metal and then you use CNC machining to refine it. In the same machine, you apply metal and then you, and then you refine it. I think it's an, it's an incredible idea. You get the economy of materials and the freedom of form, that idea that shape complexity comes for free with 3D printing. You get that, but you get the precision of CNC machining. So it's a really interesting idea. I can, I can actually watch that all day. I, 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 lo I love watching that. As a matter of fact, I do it in my house and I turn down the sound on this, but all it, it goes, eh, 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 eh. and my, my, my kids always come in and would say, will you stop watching that stuff? Because if you've ever watched, you know, CNC porn, um, the, the, two th the, the two things that it, ha it, it has, it either has the really bad sound of the machine itself, or some clever person has put a soundtrack to it that's even worse than the machine. And so I just watch it go, eh, 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 eh. Anyhow, I think this is a really interesting thing for the future in which we take these various fabrication techniques and be able to put them together. Let me show you something new because I think there's something interesting happening out there in the world. And it's this world of hardware startups. Um, many of you have seen it. I just came from Paris where we did a pop-up gallery and had a whole bunch of people who have chosen to work in startups in the way that people have often started software companies, social networking companies. We're now seeing mechanical and industrial engineers go off and start 
new companies. And it's this availability of cheap hardware and cheap software, access to information, access to crowdfunding, and people are doing some really interesting things. And I think there's a cautionary note for all of our industrial customers that the same things that have happened in the world of software, where small teams of people can do really interesting, innovative stuff, is coming to the world of hardware. This to me is a really interesting little company. It, uh, it's, it, it's based in the United States. Many of you would be familiar if you look, that's a picture of a router there. It's just a handheld wood router, uh, a store-bought one. What's interesting about it is that they modified the router so that if you were to draw a line on a piece of wood or plastic, your job is to hold the router close to the line. It adjusts 60 times a second and the bit in there moves over and it cuts precisely to the line. So through using computer vision to recognize the outline, you hold it there. And I, I find this a little bit interesting in that it's, this, is, this is a machine, it's kind of the anti-CNC router. It's the non-CNC router, but in some interesting way, we humans are doing the dumb part of just holding it in place, and the computer is actually doing the smart thing of following the line. And I'm looking forward to a whole generation of new smart tools that look like this. While I'm on the topic of fabrication, I want to show you one other thing that I thought was interesting. This is the Museum of Modern Art that's being built in San Francisco. It's constructed out of composite panels. Each one was, uh, the mold was CNC machined. It was made, these are 700 unique panels. So there's a thread that goes through most of the things I've spoken about this morning. We're getting a, with the power of computing, we're getting a new freedom of expression. Whether it's buildings that look like this, or the parts I showed you from the Formula One car, we are able now to express more complex shapes. And we now have the means available, even on a one-off project like this, to fabricate these unique panels. Now let me move into the last part. And so I think up till now I've mostly been talking about things that we can put our hands on today, we can easily wrap our heads around, you can see them coming and they're fairly immediate. But I just want to take a minute at the end as we talk about the way things will be desi designed and made to look at the future. I want to talk about biological. So th this, this is a building it was done at the Museum of Modern Art in New York by David B Benjamin and his team. And it's built out of mycelium. It's grown from mushrooms. Not sure I want to live in a mushroom house, but it's an interesting idea. This idea of actually growing things that we will use and live in. Here's some interesting work we've been doing with the Wies Institute at Harvard. This is a nanoscale robot. The robot is made out of DNA. It's made out of strands of DNA. It's assembled into a clamshell. The interesting thing about the clamshell, it has a hinge and a clasp. And when that, when that nano robot attaches to a cell, it opens up and delivers a payload of drugs. And I think the possibilities for things like this are incredible. So first of all, just think about this. We're now designing machinery at the nanoscale. This is actually built out of DNA. It's not DNA as information carrying. This is DNA as a structural element. And if you remember back to high school biology and your base pairs of A, T, C, and G, what's really interesting about this is in order to construct this, all you need to do is put the right strands into a beaker and shake it up. And it self-assembles into this shape. So this idea of self-assembly is a really interesting one for the way we build things in the future. As a matter of fact, if you think about applications of this, the idea of treating cancer or doing performance enhancing things by going right to the cell, it's gonna make things like the way we do, chemo, you know, we do chemotherapy today seem barbaric. We're going to have to explain to our kids and grandkids, 
When, when I was young, what we used to do is we just used to poison people and we hoped to kill a couple of the right cells. Um, the world is gonna change dramatically because of what we're gonna be able to do and design and engineer with biology. Here's an example of a concept car. This was done in conjunction with the folks at Daimler. And this was their imagination about what it would look like if you grew a car. So this is the idea of growing a car. Now let me say something about growing things. Because in some ways it sounds absolutely crazy that you can grow something and turn it into th things. But we actually do this every day. Nature does it every day. As a matter of fact, that acorn that you see there, it has about a gigabit of information. It's about 125 megabytes. You know, not much more than your typical, you know, like YouTube video. And what's encoded in that acorn, and all you have to do is add water and sun and nutrients, and you get an oak tree. The Ebola virus that is putting fear into everybody, it's about 1,700 bits. That's all it is. You know, and you think about it, in many ways, DNA is going to be the new software. We're going to be able to encode things into biology through the way that we change DNA. And so I think there's this interesting idea as we look into the future in which we're going to be able to predictably grow things just as reliably as this acorn turns into an oak tree. Thank you very much.